be able to accept rejection. You're going to get nothing but no, and it doesn't matter about all the no's you get, it's the one yes that you get. That's what's important. I got rejected, I applied to four film schools, I got rejected from three of them. I had no idea about USC, and that was the one I happened to get into. But I moved out here without knowing that. And, you know, but that was all it took was one yes. It's like I may not have had any kind of thing going in my career, but it took, Ava said yes, <laughs> for Queen Sugar. You're listening to Creative Breakthrough, the podcast that provides you with the strategies to elevate your creative passion to the next level. I'm your host, creative hustler, and chicken wing lover, Shireen Kassam, AKA the funny brown girl. And yes, I have an unhealthy obsession with chicken wings. Now, get ready to flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Hey, welcome back to another episode of The Creative Breakthrough. I am your host, Shireen Kassam, a.k.a. The Funny Brown Girl. Hey, we're still in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. I hope you guys are all well. I hope you're all um, staying well, staying mentally well, staying physically well, and just taking care of yourselves during this time. Um, Today, I want to talk to you about rejection and then how that can turn into resentment. But before I get into that, just some quick updates of what's going on in my life. I am still on furlough from Disney World. I think I'm now coming into week four of my furlough. And it's funny how fast time is flying, but it's also funny how different I feel. Like, I definitely feel more relaxed. I mean, in the middle of a pandemic, it's weird to be saying that I feel relaxed, but it's like the stress of focusing on me and focusing on my creative outlets and focusing on just things that make me happy has just been so exciting and just so, it's just filling me with joy. And it's just been such a different different way of living life because I, I've never gotten this chance to do that, right? I've always been working all my life since I was 16 years old. I never really had time to just stop. It's that there was a there was a bit of time when I was unemployed, um, but I hadn't really gotten into that creative mindset yet. Like I was just dabbling in creativity at that point. Um, so this has just been super exciting. And it's, it's sad and funny how fast time has flown by. Like I remember when I would go to work, I'd be like, I can't wait till it's Friday. I can't wait till it's Friday. I can't wait till it's Friday. And now every day it's like, I'm just working. Um, and it's so hard because I don't, I'm not waiting for Friday anymore. Like I know what that feels like not to, not to wait for Friday, but it has also been hard because I don't shut off. I don't turn off. Like when I worked, I would turn on my brain, sort of say at like 9 a.m., and I lie because I don't go to work till 10, so like 10 a.m. And then I would shut it off at 5, 5.30, right? And then I would turn on my creative brain. But now my brain is just on all the time, like coming up with ideas. And it's so cool because every year I start a notebook like this. I bought like a bulk set of notebooks on Amazon a couple years ago. Um, I think it was like 20, which I don't know why I did that. But it, it came out to like 50 cents a notebook and me and I love a deal. So I bought them. And usually I'll start writing in these notebooks and the year will end and I'll have finished like half of the notebook, right? This year, it's only, it's May and I've already gotten this far into the notebook. And for people watching on YouTube, you can see this. And if you're not on YouTube, basically I've got like five pages left in this notebook and I'm going to have to start a second notebook for 2020. And I'm just super excited about that because one, because I'm almost going to finish the notebook, which means I'm taking my own advice and writing every day and journaling every day. But I'm just also excited to be able to go back and read this like next year or even at the end of this year and just see how much have I grown and like what are some ideas that I didn't think were flushable at that time, but now I can flush out and really make into something. So I'm super excited about that. Um, but there is a meme I was getting to it. There was a meme that I saw and it had two people on it. One was really just, it said midnight behind them and they were working away. And then one said midnight behind them and they were sleeping. And it said, what is productivity to you? Or what is self-care to you? And it was really, it was really important for me to see that because, because I'm working for myself right now and I want to get all this stuff done. I, I have to learn how to take, I have to learn to turn off. Like I have to learn to put boundaries on my time and say, Shreen, you have to sleep at this time and you have to take care of yourself and go work out and you have to start 
start putting these boundaries because like I've noticed I haven't been going to bed till like one or two in the morning because that's when I'm hitting like my streak where I'm like, oh my God, it's midnight and I just had this great idea and I turn on the lights and I start writing and it's fine. It's, it's fine. But at some point I also have to learn to just shut off and like make notes and say to myself, like, you need to get your sleep. You need your eight or nine hours of sleep. Um, the second thing is I just finished my four week course with Seth Barish, which, who is the director of the one person shows that Mike Birbiglia puts on. And that was super exciting. That was an awesome four week course. It really got me to understand like how to put together a one person show. And I have like 20 minutes written now. And so it's just staying on top of that to get that hour out. Um, and I'm going to, I'll keep you guys posted on that. Cause I do want to do, um, kind of like, uh, reads like zoom reads where I want to invite people just to listen to it and tell me their feedback before I actually take it out and like put on a real show. And that's my goal. Like my May, 2021, I want to have this one person show done and I want it to be, I want to be performing it in a theater. And so that's my, that is my one year goal. Um, and I'm super excited about that. I really hope that now that I don't have a class and someone really to be pushing me, I'll still keep doing it. Um, I'm lucky that the people I was in the class with, we've agreed to be in a writer's group together. So we're going to keep meeting, um, bi-weekly to keep each other on track with deadlines and stuff. And then I just started a class this past weekend. It's a free class on Coursera.org. It's called storytelling. And that has been super interesting too. And it's just, it's so funny because like I storytell, right? I'm a comedian and I, I've, I've taken classes on writing and creative writing and how to be a comic. But I've never actually taken a class just on storytelling. And so they go into the whole art of storytelling and they provide all these resources and they have these people talking to us who are in the storytelling industry. And it's just so interesting to think about like how people put an idea together and how people formulate a storyline. And, and that in itself has just been so interesting. It is a very heavy loaded class. I mean, it's, I'm only on week one and I've, I, that's taken me three days to do and I haven't finished the assignment yet. Um, so there's homework to do in it, but it's super cool. And I've dropped the link on the Facebook group. So definitely check out the Facebook group. And I'm also going to drop some of the resources. So if you don't want to take the class, I'm going to drop the blog posts and the videos and stuff that they share, because I think some of these websites that they are sharing are amazing. And it's like, how did I not know these websites existed just to help create ideas and flesh out ideas. Um, so if you're not part of the Facebook group, it's funnybrowngirl.com forward slash Facebook, or you can go to Facebook and type in creative breakthrough community and it should pop up. Um, if you have any trouble, send me an email at hi at funnybrowngirl.com. So that's what I've been up to. And then lastly, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who have reached out to check on me now that I'm on furlough. I know some, it's, it can be a scary time. So I, I thank you guys for checking in on me and that, um, also those of you who have donated to my, to my fundraiser to help me pay for my podcasting equipment, which has been, has been a little bit more difficult now that there's no income coming in. So I thank you guys for that. Um, if you do want to make a donation, if you, if you are still on lockdown and can't go buy your Starbucks coffee or your bagel in the morning and you have a few dollars to donate, I would love it. Um, it's kofi.com forward slash funny brown girl. And that's K O I hyphen fi.com forward slash funny brown girl. I also dropped the link on my Instagram profile. So feel free to follow me on Instagram at funnybrowngirl.com. Okay. So like I said, today I want to talk about rejection and today I'm going to replay, um, snippets of an episode I did with Tina Mabry, who is a writer, director, and producer on the hit show Queen Sugar, as well as she's worked on other hit shows like, um, Insecure and Posse and just a lot of other things. And she was actually the first podcast interview that I launched on this podcast. Like she's, she's like OG. She's like old school in the sense, like she was episode one, y'all like we're going back because that episode was just so amazing because she, she touches on a lot of things. It's, it's an hour long episode. So definitely, um, I would highly recommend listening to the whole hour, but for today's episode, I've only cut, I've cut and pasted, um, a storyline around rejection because she really talks about rejection and, I want to talk about rejection because I have seen this happen to people. Um, and Felicia Pride, two weeks ago on the episode that we dropped two weeks ago on the Creative Breakthrough Podcast, talks about a positive mindset. And she says that she has seen people not be successful in their creative endeavors, in their creative journey, because they didn't have a positive mindset. And a lot of that positive mindset can be ruined by how you interpret interpret rejection. And I saw this meme and it says, 
You don't fear rejection. You fear interpreting rejection as if something is wrong with you. And that was so powerful because some people can see rejection as, okay, that was just a no, that's just going to make me work harder next time. Or some people will see a rejection as like, I'm not good enough. Like I, there's something wrong with me. I'm not, I can't do this. I just give up and they just give up. And then some people just see rejection as like, not that I'm not good enough, but it's like the universe telling me I should just quit. And some people will just take a rejection and quit. And I'm just, I'm here to tell you that as a creative, I have been rejected so many times. I mean, not even in my creative world, I've been rejected in the real world so many times. And I, I can sit here and tell you right now that if I had quit, I would not be making this podcast right now. I would not be taking a one person show class. I would not be, um, striving to have goals for next year. Like I have dealt with so even just in 2020, I have dealt with so much rejection, right? And and if you've been listening to the past episodes, you know what I'm talking about. I could I could just give up, but I'm not going to give up because I also believe that everything happens for a reason. And Tina Mabry talks about that in detail in today's episode as well. Everything happens for a reason. When things are right for you, things will start to happen, but you've got to put in the work. And I think I think being a creative comes down to four, four major buckets. One is, one is talent. And I think, I don't remember if it was Felicia Pride who said that, but in one of the episodes that we've recently put out, um, they talk about it. I think, I think it was Laura Diaz. Laura Diaz in episode six says it comes down to talent. You have to have talent, right? And then you have to work on that talent. You have to put in the work. You can't just rely on that talent. You have to go and keep toning that muscle. You keep flexing that muscle, right? I always end this episode saying, now go out there and flex your creative muscle. Like it's a muscle that you have to work out. You can't just let it be lazy. One, it's about talent. One, it's about hard work. And then three, it's just, it's about, it's about your network. It's about who you know, right? A lot of times it comes down to who do you know? Who in your space have you interacted with? Who have you networked with? Like a lot of times people ask me for recommendations for things. Like they'll be like, I'm looking for someone for this part in my short film, or I'm looking for somebody who can, um, I, I need somebody to go send to an audition. Do you know anybody who fits this person? And so it's like who you know. And then the fourth thing I would say is that it's just, it's being patient with yourself and staying positive and taking care of yourself. It's all about you in that, in your fourth step. It's like, how do you stay in that right mindset? Right. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples. So like when I talk about flexing that creative muscle, right last year, I was a finalist in Florida's funniest comedian competition. And I was super excited and I didn't do really well in the finals. I killed it in the first round and the semi quarterfinals and the semifinals. And then I got to the finals And I know why I know it's because I hadn't really been putting in the work into comedy last year. Like I wasn't going out to shows and uh, open mics and I wasn't really investing time. And had I been going out every day and working on my set, I would have known how to handle the situation that I was put in the night of the finals. And I can make all these excuses why I didn't win, but there was a lot of obstacles that night. Like I was, I was the last person to go up. I followed a guy who made animal sounds. I was dealing with an audience that wasn't very progressive, like not a very liberal audience. And if you listen to this podcast again, you know, I struggle with non-liberal audiences, um, especially people who don't like people that look like me or who are Muslim or have an Arab name. And so there was just a lot of things thrown at me. And because I was out of practice, I hadn't flexed that creative muscle. I can't blame anybody for how I performed that night except for myself, right? So me losing that competition wasn't that I there was something wrong with me. It was more that I hadn't taken the time or the initiative to work on my, on my craft. It was just that I didn't take that time. I didn't, I didn't put enough effort in. Again, another example is in 2019, I didn't book a single commercial audition. I actually wasn't even getting sent out on enough auditions. Um, and again, that was my fault because my agent kept asking for new headshots. She kept asking, are you taking any classes? She kept asking like, what are you doing to improve your craft? And honestly, last year I didn't do anything. I didn't take a class. I didn't go and get new headshots. I wasn't working on my craft. Um, and so when Susan or Jackie or Jessica, and those are all hypothetically fake names got the role, I can't blame them. I can't say, well, that's not fair. They must be better than me. And that's not really how I talk, but I'm, uh, pretending, but it's like, I can't, I can't blame anybody 
but myself. I can't compare myself to other people because I don't know what they're doing, right? I don't know how many classes they went and took. I don't know how many auditions they went out on. I don't know how many headshots they went and took. So I cannot compare myself. And I say all this because I actually, I've been doing a lot more creative coaching lately. Now that I've been furloughed, a lot of people have been reaching out to me and I've been doing some creative coaching. And I have this one client and he said it was totally okay to talk about him right now who who falls into this trap of comparing himself to other people especially on social media like he'll see he'll see his friends from acting classes who got who got who got auditions he didn't get or got auditions that he got but landed the part and he, and he starts to doubt himself and that doubt turns into a negative mindset because now he's like all he can think about is what's wrong with me why didn't i get that role and that positive that negative mindset actually comes out like when you're in it, when you're um doing a audition like it's like a job interview that negative mindset can really come out of you and you might think that that's weird like how how is that possible but you once you start watching audition tapes, you'll see like that person doesn't have the same confidence as other people. That person isn't delivering the lines with that same passion and confidence that you see other people doing it with because they're so in their head at that point. They're so, they're already thinking, they're already thinking that they're not going to get that role. Right. And so they're not going to get it. And so we've been talking a lot about that, uh, me and him. And I, and I, I'll be super honest with you. There are people on social media um, that I, at certain times I've been envious of and certain times I've been jealous of. And you know what? Like it, it, it's a con, it's a characteristic trait that we all deal with, right? It's un, it's an unhealthy one, but we all have it at a certain point and I will unfollow them. I won't unfriend them, but you on Facebook and on Instagram, you can unfollow people or you can mute people. And I've done that because I don't need that in my life because I don't want to feel that way because me feeling that way doesn't do anything for me creatively, right? It doesn't bring me forward. It doesn't move me forward. And so the more I was talking with this guy who's my client now, it turns out like he's also, he's also jealous of like people close to him in his life. He's also, he's jealous of his friends and that jealousy has turned into resentment where he actually hates some of his friends because he's watching them be so successful in life. And he's wondering how were they so successful in life and he's not successful in life. And so we've really been tearing apart his story and his, in what's happening in his life. And it turns out like last year he, he didn't, um, he didn't get as many auditions as he wanted, but he also, he didn't push forward his creative abilities as much because he was in school last year. He was finishing up his degree. And so that's where his mindset was last year. His mindset and his focus was on school and get graduating, right? And sometimes it's really hard when you've got such a big, important task in front of you to kind of be creative at the same time. And it, and it's totally true. And I've talked about this in previous episodes in 2019, no, 2018, I was in Lisbon, Portugal, and I had, I was having the creative time of my life. Like, if somebody asked me what was one of the best highlight and moments of your creative career, I would say Lisbon, Portugal, 2018. And then I flew back to the United States, I stepped off the plane, and I went straight to work, and I found out I had a new manager at work, and she was... She was the worst thing that could have happened to me, right? She totally destroyed my self-confidence in myself. And I was so focused then on work and I was so focused on everything she was saying to me that my mindset, one, my mindset was totally messed up. But second of all, at that point, I was so focused on finding a new job and getting out of that environment that I didn't have time to be a creative. I didn't have the, I didn't have the mental strength to be a creative. I didn't even have the, the, the mental, the mental ability to be creative. Like I wasn't coming up with any creative ideas. I didn't want to be on stage. I just wanted to find a new job. And that's where all my energy went to. So for this guy, all his energy went to school and passing school. And so he can't blame himself that he wasn't getting any auditions. But then as we started to dig more into it, it I realized he was getting these auditions, but he wasn't wasn't getting the role because his mindset was already full of so much resentment towards everybody else who was living their dreams. And so because that resentment was building up inside of him, that negativity, those negative thoughts, that negative mindset, there's just, there's just no way at that point that you can get an audition. I mean, and not get an audition, but that you can land the gig. There's just no way with all that stuff holding you down on your shoulders. You can't, there's just no way you're going to put out your best performance. Um, and so it was, it's really important as I'm working with him, it's like figuring out why do you have all that resentment for people? Why do you have all that fear? Like that people are doing better than you because 
here again, here's the thing, right? You don't know where people are on their creative journeys. So like you can't compare yourself to somebody else because you don't know all you know about their creative journey is maybe what you see on social media, right? But you, you have to sometimes take a step back and think, okay, how long ago did this person start their creative journey? What have they been in, putting into their creative journey, right? What energy have they been putting into it? What classes are they taking? How often do they spend time on their creative journey? Do they write every day? Are they always flexing or working out that creative muscle? There's just so many different um, criteria that it's just, you can't compare yourself to other people. And so what I want you to walk away with today is like you're on your own journey, right? You are you and you are your own journey. And when things are meant to happen for you, they will happen for you. But you also have to put in the work. You can't just sit back and think things are gonna happen for you. Things just don't happen for me. They really don't. Lately, I've been applying to so many different things, writing competitions, podcast competitions, and I'm not getting them. I am not, I haven't won a single like thing in like a long time. And, and I think back on it and I'm like, why am I not doing it? And it's, and it's not because my work sucks. It's not that, it's not that my writing sucks. It's not that my idea sucks. It's just that somebody else has been working on it more. Somebody else has been working on it harder. Somebody else has been putting more time into it and it's their time to shine. And I have to be happy for that person and just say to myself, like, you keep working on your idea. You keep flushing it out. You take that rejection as, as motivation to make it better and to keep trying harder. And one day you're going to win and somebody's going to ask you, why, how did you get there? How did you win that? How did you do that? And I'm going to say it was all those rejections that made me work harder and get here. And so I leave you with that. Like if you feel that you are starting to resent people and you're hating people, take a step back and look inside of you and say, why is that? And is it, is it really, is it, is it truthful to you to hate that person or resent that person? And then, and then look at your mindset. Do you have a positive mindset or do you have a negative mindset and figure out again, why is it a negative mindset and how do you flip it to be a positive mindset? And then once you start to align all that stuff, once you start to figure out like how to stay positive and optimistic, I guarantee you things are going to start looking more positive for you. You're going to start seeing more opportunities just land at your doorstep. I also want to give you one more example before I wrap this session up. Um, the client said to me, he said, I've been following your journey. And last year you booked in 2019, you booked three amazing roles. You did, you did a short film, you did a web series and, um, you did uh, a feature film. And he was like, he's like, you sit here and you tell me you, you didn't put in any effort and that you didn't do any auditions and you weren't, you weren't focused on acting. Then how did you get those roles? Like you're obviously lying to me. And I was like, Honestly, those three roles, the three roles I had in all of 2019, I got because of my network. I got because of the people I knew, people who I had taken an acting class with or that I had met at a comedy show called me up and they were like, you're the right person for this role. Will you do it? And I didn't audition for any of those roles. I didn't reach out about any of those roles. Those roles came to me. And so, like I said in the beginning, it's super important to cultivate relationships, to network, to join communities. So for example, I have this Facebook group. It's a community of creatives. Join that group, meet people, work your stuff out with people because you never know who's going to recommend you, or who's going to need somebody who looks like you or who has your background, or who has your experience. So with that, um, I'm also going to leave you with one more thing. If you need to talk to someone, reach out to your friends, reach out to your family, get a creative coach. I'm here for you. And like I said, like I've talked about many times, talk to a therapist. If you feel like you've got so many negative thoughts inside of you and, and you're so fearful of rejection and you have so much hate for people or resentment for people's successes and you can't figure out why why are you so envious and so jealous and why can't you stop comparing yourself to other people it's a lot of stuff and a lot of and, and i'm not gonna lie like it's 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 reality people go through this stuff and it, you're not by yourself you're not alone talk to a talk to a therapist get a therapist and it and i i will say this and i, I was fascinated by this this weekend um, Oprah Winfrey had a webinar and she's doing this series about like how to live your best life during this pandemic. And I signed up for it and she had Dwayne the rock Johnson on it. And he talked about his therapist and the fact that the rock sees a therapist shows you that there is nothing wrong with seeing a therapist. It does not make you weaker. There is no stigma between about seeing a therapist. It's actually, I wouldn't, I won't lie. I think it's like the cool thing to do in 2020, like get a therapist. And there's so many online that are pretty cheap, or you can even get a free one through your work maybe um, check with your health insurance company and highly highly recommend one I, I see one and it's just been great like we've been we've been working through things and we've been talking about stuff and and it's actually been a really good time to see a therapist because 
our our topics are not work focused right now. They're actually about like things outside of work, which has been great because we never get time to talk about that stuff. Oprah said at the end of uh, her session this weekend, she says, "You we can't control COVID, right? We can't control what's happening with coronavirus, but we can control our thoughts, right? So free yourself from those negative thoughts. You can control the thoughts. You can't control what's happening around you, but you can control what's in your mind. So free yourself of those thoughts. So with that, I want to introduce this episode with Tina Mabry. Like I said, she's a writer, producer, and director. Um, you've seen her with Queen Sugar. You've seen her on Insecure. You've seen her with Posse. Um, and she talks about rejection and she talks about how she grinded for years and years and years and she took so much rejection, but she didn't let it get to her. She didn't start to resent people. She didn't start to hate people. She didn't resent herself. She didn't resent the industry. She just kept chugging along until Ava DuVernay said yes to her. And then the rest is history. She's now one of the most sought out creatives in Hollywood right now. So what are we waiting for? Let's get started. How did your creative journey start? So the way that it started was kind of a, you know, everybody has a different story and, and how we get into this industry and then how we, our path. And so for me, I mean, I always loved movies like that. That was something that connected with me and my mama. Like we would watch these old Christopher Lee vampire movies. (laughs) But what it did was, you know, not so much of the quality of the movie, but we would be, we would talk and they would create discussions between the two of us. And, and I would also, also just love film and I loved writing like, and I, you know, everything that I learned, it was, everything was from TV because I didn't, you know, we were, you know, we didn't have any money as a family. So traveling was out of the picture, you know, out of the picture. So the only thing that you had to connect to the outside world was TV. And, you know, and I, it just became enamored with just creating stories. And so, I mean, like, I would take my little Happy Meal toys and <laughs> play around <laughs> with them, like, and have episodic openings. I'm like, I now realize it. <laughs> so That's I think awesome. I even took a commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. How old were you? Like, like you must have been in your elementary school? Yeah, I was probably like six, seven, eight, something around there, okay. you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I tried to write my first novel when I was 12. And so, <laughs> I mean. But, you know, I always kind of, I realize now looking back as, you know, when I tried to write another novel in college and undergrad, um, that that was just me trying to find my voice and a way to therapeutically also kind of escape my current circumstances. Um, and, you know, and I'm like, I would never show anybody what I wrote at 12. I'm like, my wife is not even privy to that. <laughs> so, I'm like, that's never going to be shown because it was horrible. But I did have a full script. I, I give myself that. <laughs> it was the beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> so that's good enough. That's hilarious. So was there a TV show or film that really inspired you growing up that you were like, this is what I want to do? At that time, like, it wasn't so much, uh, it wasn't so much like, here's one film that really kickstarting it off it's more of just the industry itself of the medium of television and the medium of film Mm -hmm. um just and its totality but what really made me change is like you know I'm an undergrad I'm a political science psychology major and I'm studying for the LSAT I'm in my last year I'm like well I guess I'm going to law school and then I watched now these are where the movies became very crucial to my life um I watched Boys Don't Cry by uh, okay. Kimberly Pierce and Love and Basketball, you yes. know, Prince Blythewood. And when I saw at the end of each film that it was written and directed by a woman, I decided to put the Elsa book down. And the next thing I did, I applied to film school and I gave myself a D date. I said, I'm leaving Mississippi no matter what, May 26, 2001. I'm driving. I'm doing what I got to do. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying. I'm gonna find. I know I've never been on an airplane. I've never been to Los Angeles. I, I found my apartment online, and I have not been accepted into school yet over here at all. And I step out uh, because I, you know, two women. I saw them and their stories and their movies touched me and stayed with me. That it set up a precedent of. That's where I've always wanted to make sure with my films or anything that I try to work on that it stays with you because of and have has an impact on people because that's what changed my life just knowing and seeing that made me know what was possible and and to go outside of even though you never see anybody making a film in Mississippi it ain't happening Uh, like it's it's very rare uh 
then chances are <laughs> a felt crew would not be yes. coming to people on Mississippi. <laughs> but um, you know, but it's like you don't have it, so it doesn't seem to exist um for you. And that's the thing about it yeah. that's so beautiful about it that right. yeah, these two women, they they changed my life. They gave me that that courage and that inspiration to actually say the hell with law school. I'm going to film school. <laughs> But, you know, but that's what that was. And it was that heartbeat that was there. And I just decided to take that chance. And I was like, mm-hmm. it's worth me driving across the country and going to a place I know nothing about. And I have no idea if I'm getting in film school or not. None. And I'm just good. But I'm going to make this work somehow mm-hmm. because it's possible. It's possible. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but it's possible. <laughs> Um, and that was a very scary, you know, scary, but at the same time, empowering moment, because I knew I didn't have the luxury to fail. Right. Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of us in that boat, we don't take those risks because we don't have the luxury to fail. And that stops us because we're scared. Right? right. Exactly. And fear can hold you back. And that's something that it either can hold you back or it can drive you. Um, and that's mm-hmm. the thing about really got to pick which one. And I, and I think that goes into just also about being in this industry or people who want to get in it. It's like, it's okay to be afraid about, about things. That's a being fear is not an issue. It's how you respond to the fear. You know what I mean? And it's, it's just one of those things like for me, you know, it's like, I, I can't let it cripple me. You know, I may like, trust me, I'm scared all the time, you know, <laughs> like writing or directing. Like in the beginning, you are so scared. even now. Yeah. Oh yes. Every time you you write something, and this <laughs> is like every writer, you feel like that's the last thing you're ever gonna write. You're like, that's it, done. I have no more stories in my life. I have no more stories to tell. <laughs> and you think it's the last. You, you're like, this is the last thing I'm ever writing. But knowing damn well that <laughs> you are are going to write again, it's weird. It, and I think it's because you put so much of yourself in it and you get that story out and you've been living with these characters for so long that it feels like I've gotten everything out that I possibly can. I I don't know what else to write about. And then one day it comes back really, really quickly. So, you know, but that's, and then I'm, yeah, we're definitely on set. You know, I'm always like nervous the night before. I'm always like, please don't waste these people money. I'm just like, I'm usually like in a hotel room, like, Oh Lord, like, can I do it? And then I just need to get the first shot off. That's it. The next, once that first shot is off, and then you're good. I'm good. Nobody ever knows I'm stressed. And I think, which is very important too for a director because that stuff spreads like wildfire. But I really also know that if I'm afraid um, before I'm embarking on something, that means I actually give a damn. And that's important because if I'm not scared, yep. I don't mm-hmm. care. And if I don't care, then that means, I mean, what am I doing it for? So that's why, you know, so you got to be very selective on the projects that you take. You know, what actually are you going to stick with? What actually moves you? You know what I mean? Hey, it's me, Shreen. Sorry to interrupt. Creative Breakthrough listeners, are you enjoying this episode? If so, I have a quick favor. Could you leave us a review, whether on Apple, SoundCloud, or whatever platform you're listening from? It's a great way to pay it forward and let other creatives know about the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, I'll get back to the original interview now. Thanks. Bye. Since then, I mean, you've had so many opportunities to write and direct episodes for hit shows like Dear White People, Queen Sugar, Insecure, Queen of the South. How did you how did you make a name for yourself to get those opportunities? I mean, everything started with um, Queen Sugar and, you know, Ava calling and giving me an opportunity of a lifetime and where it was at a point where I was actually like about to give up. Like I, I was just like, after all these years, it didn't seem like it was working. And and how many years had you been, how many years had you been doing I'd it? I've been this out point? here for like 14 years, you know, trying to make it happen. Oh, wow. And I'm like getting closer to 40 and it's like, is it going to work or not? Am I wasting my time? I'm scared. You know, what, what more do I need to do? And then, but that's the importance of having family and friends that support you. You know, my friends are like, you know, you might, if you were trying to sing, we would say, yeah, baby, go back to Mississippi because you can't sing. <laughs> they would tell me that. <laughs> but they were like, yes. no, nah, you took it of a writer director to leave. You're not going nowhere. And uh, just in like within that, within a month's time, Ava contacted me and was like, hey, 
I got a show, Queen Sugar is <laughs> going to be on own. You want to come on as a producer, a director, you know, right in the room? Uh, yes. <laughs> and then it was so much of you know Warner Brothers like oh, we, where we we need to send the paperwork to your people and I'm like I ain't got no people I'm like I have, at that point no agent lawyer nothing I was like I have no people but I was just like okay <laughs> so I had to go find uh, people but the people that I ended up connecting with and you know that was it was the best thing um, but yeah that was where I got my break and without having someone to open that door none of this would be. And that's, that's where everything started with Queen Sugar. And from there, directing on that show, and, and I can't believe, I mean, I was really honored to direct the last two episodes of season one. You know, and that was the first time I ever directed episodic. So, you know, I was really, <laughs> really scared. You know, but that show meant so much to me. Um, you know, and I just, our, our writing room, um, the cast, the crew, and you don't, and I just, we lived and breathed that story in that writing room. Um, and then on top of that, when you meet the real people who are actually the actors playing, you know, them and they're actually good people and they become your family as well. I mean, it just makes the working environment that much better. Like, you know, you're really creating magic, you know, on screen and working together, but it's like also you get a chance to have so much fun on set, which I love doing. I like having fun. Because um, I remember those days when I didn't have anything to do. <laughs> yeah, I had nothing. I'm like, I, I'm like we somehow <laughs> tricked people into paying us. Why y'all tripping? Don't get us. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, but it, it was like, but that, yeah, like, and and what, and then the irony of it is, after Ava offered me the job, and of course I said yes immediately. A week later, Gina Prince Bicewood calls me for shots fired, and she's like, I want to bring you on staff, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> like it just like it hit right That's there, awesome. and I was like, "Can I write for two shows?" I mean, I don't know. I'm like, I, I have no idea. And I'm like, "No." They were like, "No, you can't." But um, I, you know, but I'm like, here's the woman that um changed my life and made me take a chance across, make a trek across the world. I mean, it felt like the world anywhere, the country, but it was a different world for me. Um, yes. And to make me, you know, to have that, to give me that drive. And here she is, like, right here offering me a job and is my mentor and me my mentor to this day. Uh, so, like, you never see that happening, mm -hmm. you know. And Kim is a mentor as well. I never would have thought that the two women that changed my life the most, that they would be my mentors today and my friends and mm -hmm. um, people that I can rely on and can trust. I, I never would have thought that. It, it, but that's the beautiful thing about yeah about life, uh, of how it comes back around, you know, just you can't see these things coming. Mm -hmm. Yes. So did you ever, have you ever asked Ava, like, how did she come to know you to give you this opportunity? She saw Mississippi Dam, like when it was back on the festival circuit in uh, 2009 and she loved it. Yeah. Okay. And she, you know, she just really loved the film, gravitated toward it. And when she did middle of nowhere, she was like, Hey, do you mind, um, can we borrow, you know, some posters? So it would make this a film that, you know, they go see for their date. <laughs> so in the, in the movie, I was like, we got plenty of posters here. How many you need? So, so let me give it to you. <laughs> but, you know, but just kind of going around, just knowing, you, you know, on, being on the festival circuit, you know, and you, you're going to, we run in the same groups, you know, as filmmakers and especially as black women, you know, we, we try as best we can to make sure that we know our community and that we help each other. And so, yeah, she was just a really big, big fan of the film and she was like no I don't want to bring you on as a staff writer you know what you're doing for tv I've seen you do all these programs here you're going to come in as a producer um and like that never happens and that uh, also changed my life it's what I'm able to do as a writer in writing rooms um because my position I'm not starting down as a staff writer I'm already at the producer level and that wouldn't have happened if she wouldn't have done that and so I will always be forever grateful to Ava for opening that door for me when no one else did. So now you said you were in LA for 14 years, really just grinding and hustling and waiting for that big break. What were you doing in those 14 years? Like what were the highs, the lows? Like what were you doing to get your name out there? Um, I was like, I had had my short film, my thesis film. I'd co-written a comedy feature, itty bitty titty committee, uh, which is ironic for me for, for, for different reasons. Uh, and I'm like, and also writing a comedy uh, was a whole new kind of 
sing another genre for me. Um, and I had done these things, but you know, I didn't have an agent. I had no representation. And, that, and I thought that as soon as I got out of film school that you made your thesis film, you show it at first look for USC, there you go. Now here comes an agent. And that's not how it works. You know, and also, and I didn't know how to really use the festival circuit back then of how, where should I premiere this? And the thing is, the movie got a lot of traction and it got a lot of airplay too, Showtime, and um, when it was like BTJ, you know, before it became centric and all, you know, it's just on uh, all networks is really playing and really going around and touring with the film as well. So, um, you know, that's just one of those things just, that I, you know, I just thought that that was going to be it, but it just didn't work out that way. And so I was disappointed by it. So I took, you know, I took a job at Sony and TV marketing department, editing Judge Hatchet episodic uh, promos. <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, doing this, uh, Judge Maria Lopez. Uh, so we really get this show. Uh, and you just doing that is, you know, like I, I realized the divide between corporate and creative too at that time um because i was like oh i want to you know i want to write on the show but this is not the way that you know i could you could see the segregation between that that they didn't want you to anybody to cross over and and i was like okay well that seems to be the rules and then at that point once that job um ended i ended up going to the boys group home i worked there uh, for for a while then that home got shut down and, and then i was like oh my god i have no job what am I going to do? <laughs> and I'm like, luckily I had a friend who was um, at the Art Institute and he was actually over the, over the department. And so he hired me to work in the film department. So I became a teacher there and then also taught at Cal State Long Beach. So I just taught every subject possible. And I did that for about five years until I got on Queen Sugar. And um, once I got you know, on Queen Sugar, of course, I have to quit my job <laughs> as a teacher. I didn't have enough time to do justice for both things. So, but that was what I did in between. And I kind of resigned myself to thinking, you know, I was going to be one of those people, I guess, in the end, that they're going to be, they're going to be the teach, not do, you know, uh, one of those people. Um, mm -hmm. But what I really realized now is that it actually made me a better artist by actually going through what I went through. Um, and I think success and opportunities come when they're supposed to. And I believe when there were certain things, like as much as I wanted things to be different with Mississippi Dam, I don't think there were certain things that I personally would have been ready for to handle, you know, going out with a film and having and pushing it in a different kind of way, especially on such a large scale, um, like the way that I can now, um, just for the sheer fact that I've grown, you know, I'm growing up and you're more confident, you're more assured of what you do know and you know how to ask questions about what you don't um and not have any shame with mm -hmm, it because right. that's why i see a lot of people fall short <laughs> i'm like the only dumb question is the one you don't ask it's okay to ask people stuff like it doesn't mean that that, that you know don't get your ego yeah. involved in this shit i mean sorry <laughs> i don't know if i can curse hold on that's you fine. know it's you know, <laughs> <laughs> no worries <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to get, get yeah, passionate. I, I am with a foul mouth. No, I mean, <laughs> they say the most intellectual people have the foulest mouths. Okay, well, that's good. Then I'm going to make it. I think all my scripts are R rated. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, if we, if we get a good one. It's always strong language <laughs> on my, my episodes or whatever. So, but yeah, but I mean, it's just not, not to let ego get in the way of it. Um, and just know that insecurity. It comes across in like a little wave that's just because you know like I, we said discussed earlier about you're just afraid and because something is new and it's okay to feel not a hundred percent confident in it the first time you do it because you just had takes like anything else it takes you have to build that muscle and and then you're you'll get to a point where you're like that part doesn't phase you as much but then later on there'll be something else new that will you'll have to go through that same process to wrap up, what advice would you have for creatives on their journey? The one thing I would say is that one, be able to accept rejection. You're going to get nothing but no's. And it doesn't matter about all the no's you get. It's the one yes that you get. That's what's important. I got rejected. I applied to four film schools. I got rejected from three of them. 
I had no idea about USC and that was the one I happened to get into, but I moved out here without knowing that. And, you know, but that was all it took was one. Yes. It's like, I may not have had any kind of thing going in my career, but it took Ava said yes <laughs> for queen sugar. It took one thing. And so it's like to be able to not let that, that, you know, deflate you or take away or make you doubt your talent. Um, that you can just understand that this is just the process of how things are in our industry and that, you know, get a, get back on for it, but don't let that discourage you. Let that know, encourage you. What does it tell you? It tells you that you got some hope coming and a yes will come your way. And also that to be patient and that's the heart. I mean, I struggle with patience myself still. I mean, it, I think we all kind of do. It, but it's so easy to be patient, you know, and patient with this process because you really want to get out there and, and work and you want to be able to have fun with that and create something that affects lives. But you may not get that chance, but it will come. Be patient. Um, and then also educate yourself. I try to connect with people who are doing it in this industry. Try to shadow them. I think shadowing is the most important thing that you can do. Um, whether you can get a chance to sit into sitting sit in a writing room shadow that way or be on set and shadow a director or you know or shadow them through prep the whole way to see how it is because I think it lets you know like you might want to do this even more after you see it or you might be like uh, maybe I want to do this part instead you know but how can you know if you never see it you know and that's the thing right. about it that I think that's the part that yeah. missing in our industry a lot of it is because it's so it's so set off and it's so private you don't know so you're walking into a writer's room even though every room is different there still is a constant that kind of flows through it but you, but you won't know unless you're in, involved in it you won't know what it takes to actually what do you have to go through as a director to prep something for an episodic you know directing gig and how to execute that and be on time how to act with the writers the actors and do all of that you would not know that if you weren't able to sit there and watch that director do it and be able to ask them questions and talk about it, why they made certain decisions, you know? So, you know, that to me is one of the most invaluable things that you can get. And so that's what I would just say is just be patient because that yes is coming, get a backbone for the nose, and then try to find a way to shadow somebody so that part is something I think people you need to always look out to have in your life. And so for me, George and Gina are just a small, you know, gathering of people who I are my mentors that have been through things that I'm about to go through and it's my rise in my career. And they are so willing to help and to give advice. And without that advice, I can't make it. It's going to be harder for me. And they're so open with giving it. So we have to continue to do that and pass it down. Every time I listen to this interview with Tina Mabry, I get more and more inspired. Just her optimism, her persistence, her motivation to be successful. It's just so inspiring. Key takeaways from this episode. One, be okay with rejection. Two, fear can hold you back or it can drive you. Three, Success and opportunities come when they're supposed to. Four, it's the one yes you get. That's what's important. And five, don't stop pushing forward with your goals. Your time will come. Hey, check out episode two of the Creative Breakthrough podcast for the entire episode with Tina Mabry. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. Until then, go out there and flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Thanks for listening. Stay connected about upcoming resources, including opportunities, festivals, competitions, and grants to help you grow your creative passion by subscribing to my bi-monthly newsletter by visiting funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. Don't miss out on a life-changing opportunity and subscribe today at funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. And hey, if you decide to go on Instagram today, follow me. I'm Funny Brown Girl. I'm Shereen Kassam, and you've been listening to Creative Breakthrough. Now, go flex your creative muscle and keep winning.